the topic of this evening's talk of mine is, is the Quran God's word? Many people have a misconception that Islam is a new religion that came into existence 1400 years ago and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the founder of this religion. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on this earth. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of this religion, but he is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, to whom was revealed the last and final message, the glorious Quran. All the messengers that came before the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only sent for a particular group of people. And this message was supposed to be followed only by that group of people for a limited time period. Since all the other revelations were meant only for a particular group of people and was meant for a particular time period, the miracles performed by the earlier messengers, by the earlier prophets, for example, the parting of the sea, giving life to the dead, it satisfied the people of that time. But today, we cannot go back in time to examine these miracles, to verify these miracles. But Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was not sent only for the Muslims or only for the Arabs. The glorious Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to the whole of humanity, as a mercy to all the worlds. Since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not sent only for the Muslims and the Arabs, but he was sent for the whole of humanity, and he was the last messenger, the miracle that was given to him is not time-bound. The miracle that was given to him should satisfy the people at that time, even today, as well as till eternity. Since he is the last messenger, that's the reason the miracle given to him should satisfy and be examinable till eternity. Though Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he has done and performed hundreds of miracles, but he never emphasized them. And we Muslims, we mainly boast of his ultimate miracle, that is, the glorious Quran, which is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it is a miracle of all times. It could satisfy the people of that time. It can even satisfy today until the last day. It could be verified and examined that time. It can even be verified today. And inshallah, it can be verified and examined even till the last day. That's the reason it is the miracle of miracles. As far as the Quran is concerned, any human being who has the slightest knowledge of the Quran, irrespective whether he is a Muslim or non-Muslim, he will agree that the Quran was first recited by a man by the name of Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was born in the city of Arabia, that is Mecca. There is no difference of opinion amongst anyone who has the slightest knowledge of the Quran, irrespective of whether he is a Muslim or non-Muslim. As far as the origin of this Quran is concerned, there can be various allegations, replies, right or wrong. All of them can be broadly classified into three categories. The first, that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was consciously 
subconsciously or unconsciously the author of the Quran. The second category, the Quran was written by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who learned it from other sources, or he copied or plagiarized from other religious scriptures. And the third category is that the Quran has got no human origin, no human source. And it is word by word the revelation from Almighty God. Any answers you have for the origin of the Quran can be broadly classified into these three categories. They can be 100 answers. All of them will fit in these three categories. Today, let us examine and let us verify the various answers given by different human beings. Time will not permit us to deal with all of them, since the time is limited. I will pick up the more famous and the more important answers given by different human beings. First, we'll discuss, can Muhammad, peace be upon him, be the author of the Quran? whether consciously, subconsciously, or unconsciously. It is rather a tragedy that a person disagrees when a person disclaims that he is not responsible for any great work, whether literary or whether scientific. But this is exactly what the Orientalists and the critics of Islam do when they say Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the author of the Quran. Never ever has the Prophet ever claimed that he was the author of the Quran. Not even a single word of the Quran. He never claimed it. Yet, when he disclaimed that he was not the author, and the Quran happens to be a masterpiece in the work of Arabic, so why will a person disclaim the responsibility of a work which is a masterpiece? Why should he lie? And we know from history, from his youth till the day he claimed prophethood, at the age of 40 years, never has a single lie reported to have been said by Muhammad, peace be upon him. History never reports a single lie. And before he claimed prophethood, he was known for his truthfulness, his honesty, and chastity, and he was given the title Al-Amin, the trustworthy by friends and foes alike. And there are several examples. Even those people, after the prophet claimed prophethood, and they said that he was lying, Yet his enemies, his foes, they kept their valuables with the Prophet for safety. And this is known when the Prophet migrated from Makkah to Medina, and he told his nephew, Hazrat Ali, may Allah be peace with him, that give these valuables to the rightful owners. Even his foes, even after they said he lied, yet they trusted him and kept their valuables with him. Why? And we have the example that Abu Sufyan, who was the chief of one of the tribes of Makkah, when he went to Emperor Heracles and asked him for support against the Prophet, and when the Emperor asked him that, do you know of any instance in which the Prophet lied? Or has he done any injustice? And Abu Sufyan, even though he was the enemy of the Prophet that time, he had to reply, no. So why should a person with such honesty and trust and chastity, why should he lie? Let us analyze the various claims made by Orientalists and the critics of Islam against Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We'll just discuss the major ones. One of the claims made by the critics of Islam is that the Prophet, he lied that he was not the author of the Quran and said it was Almighty God for material gains. We know that there are many men 
who claim to be prophets, who claim to be preachers, who claim to be saints in order to lead a luxurious life. And we have hundreds and thousands of examples in this world today also. But if we see the lifestyle of the prophet, he led a more luxurious life before he claimed prophethood than after he claimed prophethood. He was married at the age of 25 to a rich lady by the name of Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her. And his life after claiming prophethood was unenviable. So if he did for money, his life should be better after claiming prophethood. Like we see today, those people who claim to be prophets and saints and sages. Furthermore, we have records in several Sahih Hadith, including the Hadith narrated by An-Nawi in Riyadh Salin, Hadith number 492, that one of his wives, Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she said that there were times when fire was not lit in the house for a month or two, indicating that food was not cooked for a month or two in the house. And we only survived on dates and water, and sometimes milk given by the neighbors. There are various instances, and even verses mentioned in the Quran, that the life was so simple, though he had all the power, he was the leader, he could have led the most luxurious life in the whole of Arabia. That is the reason that there was an occasion when his wives, they protested. And they said that what is the need for us to lead such a life when we can live a much comfortable life? Immediately, there was a revelation sent by Almighty God in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 29, where it says that, O Prophet, tell your consorts, tell your wives, if they care for the enjoyment of this world and the glitter of this world, I will set you free to enjoy this world and give you a handsome reward. But if you care for the life in the year after, you will be rewarded in the next life. That means the wives, they objected that why should we lead such a simple life when we can lead at least a much better life. And immediately the wahi was revealed. But natural wives of the Prophet, then they asked for forgiveness. And they preferred the life in the year after than this world. We have the example in the hadith of Riyadh Salihin, hadith number 465 and 466, where the Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, said that whenever the Prophet received any gifts, he never kept it for himself. Neither did he keep it for the future, and he gave it away to the poor people. And it is mentioned in this very same Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 79. يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِهِمْ ثُمَّ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ إِنْدِ لِيَشْتَرُوا بِهِ ثَمْنًا قَلِيلًا Woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say, this is from Allah, this is from God, to traffic with it for a miserable price. Woe to those for what their hands do write and what they gain therefrom. Now imagine if the Prophet would have lied that this book is from Almighty God and when actually he was the author, there were high possibilities that one day he would have been exposed. And he would be cursing himself in the same book. That woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say, this is from Allah. If he would have written the Quran and attributed it to Almighty God, would have ever mentioned in such a verse in the Quran. There are some critics who say that maybe the Prophet attributed the Quran, though he was the author, because he wanted fame, status, glory, as well as leadership. According to Michael H. Hart, he writes in his book, The Hundred Most Influential Persons in the History of Humankind. And he analyzes 
all the human beings from Adam peace be upon him till the present time. And undisputedly, he puts Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him as number one, as being the most influential person in the history of humankind. So if you wanted to become a leader, he didn't have to claim that the Quran was from God, if he actually was the author. And Michael H. Hart, he gives reasons for each person, why did he give him number one, number two, number three, etc. And at the end of the biography he says that it was the indisputable secular and religious influence of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that makes him the undisputable number one person to have the most influence in human history. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, if he wanted glory, fame, power, leadership, he was so eloquent. He had all the qualities. He did not have to falsely attribute the Quran to Almighty God. He had all the abilities. And if we analyze logically, any person who wants power, glory, leadership, fame, status, along with him is attached good food, fancy clothes, magnificent places, monumental palaces, guards, etc. But if you see the lifestyle of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he mended his own clothes, he repaired his own shoes, he milked the goat, and he did his own household work. He sat on the floor and ate. When he went to the marketplace, he didn't have any colorful guards. He was an example of simplicity and humbleness. And anyone who invited him, even the poor people, he used to accept their invitation and he used to eat whatever was served to him. So much so that his enemies, they pass a remark, which is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 61. Oh, he listens to everyone. His enemies, they were angry. What kind of a person is this? He listens to each and every one, even the poor people. And there are many instances and occasions which are recorded in history and in the Ahadith. And one such instance is there was a representative from the pagan Arabs by the name of Uduba. And he comes to the Prophet and says that we will give you all the wealth in Arabia, make you the richest man of Arabia. We will even make you the leader. If you want, we'll make you the king. Only thing we want from you is that you should stop spreading this message that there is one God. If the prophet wanted leadership, if he wanted to become the king, he would have accepted this offer very easy. There are several examples. We have the example that when the pagan Arabs, they told his uncle Abu Talib, that ask and if you to give up the message of universal brotherhood, of the oneness of God. He replies to his uncle that even if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I will not stop my mission. I will not stop spreading this message until the day I die or whatever Allah wills. There was a time when his son Ibrahim he died, and it coincided with an eclipse. So immediately the people said, ah, this is a sign from God. The sun is mourning because a person has died, the son of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Immediately the prophet replied, and he said that the sun and the moon, they are signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not eclipse because of the birth or the death of any human being. If he wanted fame and power, it was a very good opportunity. He could have said, yes, because my son died, we see the heavens are mourning. But he didn't do that, because he's a truthful person. Some of the critics, they say that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, knows Billah. He attributed the Quran to Almighty God because he wanted to unite the Arabs. It's known as the Arab unity and liberation theory. The various theories propounded by the critics and the Orientalists. 
There is not a single verse in the Quran which singles out and speaks exclusively of the Arab unity. Not a single verse. Exclusively talking about the unity or the liberation of the Arabs. The Quran has the concept of Ummah. That's the nation. Of the whole humankind. And the criteria for any human being to be superior to any other human being, it's not caste, it's not color, it's not wealth, it's not sex, but it is taqwa. And this is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Jurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, where Allah says, Ya ayyu an nasu inna khalaknaakum in zakin wa unsa wa jalnaakum, shu'uba wa kaba'a ila li ta'rafu, inna karmukum in the loyat kaakum, inna la alimun khabir. O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female, and have divided you into nations and tribes, so that you may recognize one another, not that you may despise one another. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not caste, color, creed, sex, wealth, but it is taqwa, it is God consciousness, it's piety, it's righteousness. There are many verses in the Quran in order to stand for truthfulness. It even says, you can do that even if you have to go against the relatives. There can be a dispute between the father and son, between husband and wife, even between relatives, if you have to fight for the truth. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24, Kul in kana abaukum. Say whether it be for your fathers, wa abnaukum, or your sons, wa ikhwanukum, or your brothers, wa azwajukum, or your spouses, wa ashiratukum, or your relatives, wa amwa lunik taraf tumuha, wa tijaratun takshawna kasada, wa masakinu tarzawnaha, the wealth that you've amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live. Allah says that if you love all these eight things, your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your spouses, your relatives, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live, the wealth you have amassed, Allah continues. Habba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi. If you love all these things more than Allah, His Rasul, and doing jihad, striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, فَتَرَبَّسُ wait. حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ الْيَمْرِ وَاللَّهُ لَا دُلْكُمُ الْفَاسِكِينَ Wait until Allah brings His decision unto you. Until Allah brings His destruction to you. And Allah guides not the fasik people. So if the Prophet wanted unity amongst the Arabs, why did he mention such a verse in the Quran? It's further mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 103. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. So here, the Prophet is talking about the unity of the believers. He is not talking about the unity of the Arabs. And if he wanted to unite the Arabs, he could have easily taken the leadership and become the leader and the king and united the Arabs easily. There are verses in the Quran which are contrary to this theory. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 43. It says, وَإِسْكَالَةِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَمَرِمُ And behold, the angel said, O Mary, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اسْتَفَاكِ وَتَحَرَكِ That Allah has chosen thee and purified thee and purified thee above the women of all nations. Imagine the Quran says that Mary the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him, who was a Jewess. She is chosen as the woman above all the women in the world. If he wanted unity among the Arabs, he could have chosen his mother, or his wife, or his daughter, any Arab woman, as the woman above all the nations. But he goes out of the way to say, Mother Mary, who was the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him, is the woman chosen above the women of all nations. And the reason is, it's immediately mentioned in the next verse, in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 45, that it is nothing but an inspiration 
from Almighty God. He has no choice. He has no choice to agree or disagree because this is a wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So surely, there are various other verses in the Quran, several times including Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 47 which says that don't you remember the favors which we have bestowed on the children of Israel, on Bani Israel. So all these verses of the Quran, if Prophet Muhammad knows Billah, he was the author of the Quran, God forbid, then why should he mention such verses in the Quran? The other allegation or theory is known as the theory for moral reformation. The Prophet attributed the Quran to Almighty God because he wanted to reform the people. Now why should a person lie? Because he wants to reform the people morally. If you want to be truthful, you cannot lie to be truthful. The means should match with the goal. And the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 93, that who can be a more wicked person than a person who invents a lie against Almighty God and says he has received inspiration when he has not? There were chances that one day, later on, the Prophet would have been exposed and he would be calling himself a wicked person in his own book, if you are the author, knows Billah. God forbid. It's mentioned in Surah Hakka, chapter 69, verse number 44, 45, 46, 47, that if the Prophet was to invent anything in our name, we would surely hold him by his right hand and cut off the very artery of his heart, and no one will be able to save him from our wrath. Allah is telling the Quran that if the Prophet or if any other human being had to invent a lie or a saying in the name of Allah, then Almighty God would have held the Prophet with his right hand and would have cut the very artery of his heart and no one would be able to save him. There are other people who say, knows Billah, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you are suffering from mythomania. This is a psychological disorder that a person mentions a lie and he believes it is the truth. Mythomaniac is a person who tells a lie and he believes that it is a fact. And a psychologist, he treats the person by giving him more facts. Suppose a person says that I am a king. The psychiatrist will not say that you are crazy. The psychiatrist will say, you are a king, where is the queen? So the mythomaniac will say, the queen has gone to a mother's place. Where is the minister? The minister has died. Where are your guards? The more you keep on posing facts, then he says, I think I'm not the king. And if you analyze the Quran, the Quran mentions about facts, keeps on giving facts and figures, facts, mentioning about historical things. So the Quran is a treatment for a mythomaniac. It's not a book written by a mythomaniac, knows Billah. Furthermore, there are some critics who say, and they believe in the religious illusion theory, saying that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he wrote the Quran from his knowledge, from his experience, from various events and surroundings without knowing that he was actually the author of the Quran. Some say that Naus Billah, God forbid, he was a crazy person. Now, no person who has an illusion or no person who's crazy can be so firm and accurate constantly for a period of 22 and a half years. The Quran wasn't revealed in one shot or in one day, or at one moment, it was revealed over a period of 22 and a half years. No person who has an illusion or has a visionary can be so constant for a period of 22 and a half years. And there are various occasions. For example, in Surah Kahf, chapter number 18, verse number 22. 
when the people asked about the story of the people of the cave, or about Zulkarnain, he said, I will answer you tomorrow. But the prophet could not give the answer tomorrow. He kept on postponing it for 15 days until a revelation came in Surah Kaaf, chapter number 18, verse number 23, 24, that, oh, prophet, never say, I will do tomorrow without adding, inshallah, if Allah wills. Imagine for 15 days, the prophet was in tension. He was sad that, why isn't the wahi coming? So then Allah sends the wahi. That do not say, I will say tomorrow without saying, inshallah, that if Allah wills, if God wills. And if he wrote it from his mind, he would have immediately given the answer or given the answer next day. So because there was a delay, many people accepted Islam and they realized that this cannot be a handiwork of a human being. It has to be a revelation. And that was is included even today in the Quran. If a person who writes the Quran, why should he mention such a verse in the Quran? Indicating that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not crazy, and he had no illusion. There are another group of people who say, the Prophet knows Billah was crazy. Then we prove him. How can he be crazy? Then they say, no, that he was a liar. And we prove he's not a liar. Then they say he was both. A person can either be crazy or a liar, but he can never be both. Because a crazy person, when you ask him a question, he immediately gives a reply whether logical or not. A liar will think and try and give an answer which is correct. So both are contradicting. And we know that the prophet was neither of the three, neither crazy, neither liar, neither both. So surely, with all these replies, we can surely realize that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was not the author of the Quran. Let's discuss the second category, that the prophet, he learned it from other sources, or he copied or plagiarized from the other religious scriptures. There are various allegations made by non-Muslims and the critics of Islam that the prophet, he learned the Quran from a Roman blacksmith who was just living in the outskirts of Makkah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a revelation in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 103. We know that they say that you learned it from someone, but do they not know that his language is foreign and this Quran is Arabic pure? The Roman blacksmith, he could hardly speak Arabic. He was a foreigner. And you're saying that Prophet learned it from him, and this Quran is a book written in Arabic, which is so pure and eloquent. It is like someone saying that a Chinese man who does not know English, he has taught Shakespeare to write the book. There are other allegations that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he learned the matter of the Quran from Warqa. Warqa ibn Nawfil, was the relative of his wife, Hazrat Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her. 